going to get started. Um, as you guys know, today is Mother's Day. In case you didn't know, now you know. It's Mother's Day. <laughs> this is actually one of the most celebrated days of the year. Um, I was looking up some stuff online. It's also one of the most heavily marketed days of the year. Last year, there was $21.4 billion dollars spent by Americans in honor or celebration of their moms. Um, it is the second most expensive holiday, placing it directly behind Christmas, and it actually beats out Valentine's Day by about three billion dollars. So let me tell you, we love our moms. Uh, the second Sunday in May, as we know, is always has historically in America um, for those of you who don't know, other countries usually celebrate it a different day. That's why sometimes if you're on Facebook or on the internet, you'll see Australia or England, they have different days. So, um, but it's always in America been set aside to encourage those women who wear the badge or the label of mother. It's a way to honor these courageous women for enduring sleepless nights, endless laundry. If any of you have free time, you're welcome to come to my house because it never stops. Um, nasty diapers, spit up, throw up, and an amazing assortment of concoctions that can come out of an infant at any moment in time, especially when you're dressed ready to go to work or to church. It always happens at that moment. Raising kids is no easy task. It's certainly gratifying, but it's a lot of day in and day out work that flies under the radar, that isn't seen, that isn't heard. And it leaves many mothers, many women feeling unseen, underappreciated, and weary, despite the gratification that comes from raising children. But you know, as I was preparing for this day, I kept coming back to, as a body of Christ, we need to remember that Mother's Day can also be one of the most painful days for many women. It's hard for the women who have experienced a miscarriage, losing that child before they were ever able to actually embrace the child. Or those who have longed for children, but have never been able to have children. Their body aches to have life birthed within them. Their arms long to rock that child to sleep, and yet they've never been able to do that. For those who, and they would give, they would take those sleepless nights that many of us as young moms complained about, those women that battle infertility would take those in a heartbeat, let me tell you. Then you have those who grieve the relocation of a child to heaven way too soon. Mixed emotions uh, carry them through that day. Many, I have friends at work who won't even come out of their house because of the pain that they suffer because of the Mother's Day. It's hard for women who no longer have custody of their kids or for those who wanted to adopt and couldn't adopt it falls through every time. You see, sometimes we have that thought that, well, you don't have kids of your own, just adopt. I know one couple, five times they'd gone through the adoption process and every single time they got to the end of it and it would fall apart. <coughs> so there's heavy, heavy pain that comes from that. It's difficult for the mom who has a uh, severed relationship with their kids. Maybe they're, they're not speaking. Maybe their child is that prodigal that the circumstances, it doesn't appear that those children are going to return anytime soon. Mother's Day can be really hard for them. Those who have difficult relationships with their current moms. You know, maybe it's a relationship filled with stress or anxiety or pain because of the way uh, their childhood was. And then you have those who grieve the loss of their mother, who they thought hung the moon and the stars. So it's a very difficult day on one hand, despite the very joyous occasion on the other. And as a body of Christ, we need to be aware of that. Sometimes we can get caught up in the celebration and the joy, and we forget that there's those sitting in many churches today, those who chose not even to come to church because of the pain of the day. And today we want to acknowledge that. We want to say we rejoice with those who are rejoicing. But we're also mourning with those who mourn this day. And no matter what your circumstance, we want you to feel loved and honored today. Maybe you're sitting here and you're saying, this doesn't really apply to me. I don't have kids. But whether or not you have natural kids, you can mother. Because mothering is mentoring. It's training. It's pouring into the lives of others. 
And in Titus 2, we're reminded that we're called to train up the next generation. So no matter how young you are, there's always someone younger than you that you can pour into, that you can help, that you can encourage, that you can find a way to be there and walk through life with them. You know, I think of Paul in uh, Romans 16, 13, who says, he says, uh, Greek Rufus, whom the Lord picked out to be his very own, and also his dear mother, who has been a mother to me. Rufus's mom was not Paul's mom. But here, Rufus, Ru, Paul is honoring Rufus's mother, saying she was like a mom to me. Now, if you remember, Rufus was the father of si Rufus's father was Simon. He was the one who carried the cross for Jesus when Jesus could no longer carry it. So I, I, my mind just goes to that place where Simon must have, after that day, came home, shared with his wife, shared with his two boys, Rufus and Alexander, how that legacy carried on. And then Rufus's mom, somehow her path crossed with Paul. How the stories must have been related to Paul. And Paul says, tell her hi, honor her because she's been like a mother to me. Talk about spiritual parenting. So hopefully today, no matter what your status is, whether you're married or single, whether you're a mother or a father, whatever it is, hopefully you'll be able to pull a little something from today. Because I know many times Mother's Day, same thing happens on Father's Day. Well, that's not me, so I check out. Don't check out today. See what you can pull, and hopefully it speaks to your heart. So how many of you have seen the uh, TV show Mythbusters? You guys ever watch that? My nephew, Michael, we watched it constantly in our house. It was set on D that and Crocodile, whatever his name was. No. Hunter, yes. Um, it, it was on record on our, back then it was a VHS player, <laughs> um, but it was on record. For those of you who don't know, it's a TV show where this team of uh, people, I think it was two men and at one point they had a female with them, they de debunk urban legends and they use elements of the scientific method to test the validity of myths, of internet videos, of stories, of legends, uh, to determine whether it was busted or confirmed. Okay? So there were a couple of episodes where they did uh, this thing called the battle of the sexes, where they tested ideas such as, are men actually better at throwing a ball than women? How many would say that's confirmed? How many would say that got busted? It was busted. Men are not better at throwing a ball than women. Other things such as women are better at multitasking than men. Raise your hand if you think that got confirmed. Raise your hand if you think that got busted. That was actually confirmed. <laughs> Others such as men are better at following maps. Busted. <laughs> confirmed. It was busted. <laughs> now they also did one about uh, do men, will men ask for directions than women? And actually that was busted. It said that men on average ask for directions just as much as women. The other one was women are better at parallel parking than men. Confirmed. Busted. It was definitely busted. <laughs> especially in today's society where uh, most people don't even know what parallel parking is. So today we are going to do some myth busting of our own in regards to moms and wives and women. Um, our main verse today is going to be out of Romans 12:2. In the NLT version it says, don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. Now, I learned this verse in the NASB, the New American Standard, and it said, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. But it was interesting. I read in the uh, Passion Translation, it says, which is up there for you guys, Stop imitating the ideals and opinions of the culture around you, but be inwardly transformed by the Holy Spirit through a total reformation of how you think. 
This will empower you to discern God's will as you live a beautiful life, satisfying and perfect in His eyes. Now I know this is not a typical Mother's Day scripture. Probably never heard it in relation to a Mother's Day sermon. But just remember, I'm not typical. So (laughs) that's kind of where my brain goes. So the first myth that we're going to debunk is the expectation of the perfect mother or woman. As many of you uh, heard or know, about six months ago, we had a new arrival at our house by the name of Chase. Cute little puppy, Havanese puppy, fluffy. It was intended to be a early Christmas present for the boys. How many of you know who gets to take care of the puppy? Yeah. But you know, as I was thinking, it was very interesting. As puppyhood arrived at our house again, um, we've had puppies in the past, but it had been a long time since we had a new puppy. Those first couple of nights, it was waking every two to three hours to the whimpers and the cries, wanting attention, being scared, needing to go potty. So getting up, getting down, getting settled. By the time you got settled, it was get back up, go back out, walk him to the grass. Well, his little legs were just about this short, so he couldn't walk in the grass, so you had to take him around to the side. Let me tell you, it was an interesting couple of weeks in our household. Fun, tiring, okay? There are, of course, substantial differences between pet parenting and people parenting. Not the least of which is that puppies don't wear diapers most of the time. So you literally have to get up and take them out. Whereas with the kid, you just roll over, you change the diaper, they go right back to sleep. Like 2.5 seconds, hopefully. Now if you have twins like I have, that's a little different. So, But you know, it's very similar. Owning pets, I know Danny and uh, Eddie own pets. It's very similar. It's like having a child. But as I thought about it, do you know one of the biggest differences between being a pet parent and a people parent? It's the expectations. You know, with puppies, as long as you don't buy the puppy from a puppy mill or a bad breeder, people usually leave you alone in regards to how you raise that puppy as long as there's not abuse involved. You know, many people choose to leave their pets in crates during the day. Some have free roam of the house. That would be our household. You walk in, there's, they, they just go wherever. Others, the cats are indoor cats only. Whereas other people, they let their cats roam the neighborhood and come home when they're hungry. Kibbles are kibbles. Toys are toys. It's not that people don't have opinions. But they usually leave you alone and they they look at it and say, oh, look at the cute fluffy ears. Look at that little nose, how cute, how handsome. But parenting, human beings, everybody has an an opinion. And it, it doesn't just stay as an opinion. It crosses into, if you're not doing it this way, then you're wrong and you don't love your child. Culturally, the norm is for others to place extreme expectations on mothers, dictating their actions, judging them, especially when they choose a different way. One article that I read stated that the unrealistic expectations of modern mothers have increased over time and in fact set mothers further back, not to an extent, to an extent not seen before the 1950s. Talk about going backwards. Today, the decisions for mothers that are usually judged by circumcision. Do you circumcise or do you not now? Vaccination. Are you going to vaccinate your children or are you not? And if you you choose not to, let me tell you, there's a whole horde of people over here saying, oh, you're wrong, you're wrong. And if you choose to, there's another multitude of people saying, you're wrong. Breastfeeding. Co-sleeping, homeschooling, working versus staying at home. And then you have decisions for women in general that routinely get judged, such as marrying or choosing to stay single. 
choosing not to have children, having a career, having a strong personality, having leadership abilities, and the list goes on and on. And you know the crazy part? How often does this transpire even in the churches of today? How many times have you heard Proverbs 31 used to encourage women? And yet the women leave feeling more frustrated, disappointed, and hurt than before they walked in. You walk into a Christian bookstore and there is no shortage of books on how to be a godly wife, how to be a godly mom, how to be a godly woman in general. Proverbs 31 in many circles has been exalted to be a checklist of the ideal woman, the perfect wife or mother. But you know, godly womanhood, godly motherhood, can't be measured by externals. In 1 Corinthians 13, Paul says we could do everything right. We could go down that Proverbs 31 checklist and check them all off. And yet still have a hard, unloving heart that's far from God. Maybe we need to switch that checklist from Proverbs 31 to Galatians 5, 22 and 23. But the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against these things. Can I just say, God does not judge you by the external. God is all about your heart. He is all about the internal. We're not called to conform to the image of Proverbs 31 any more than we are called to conform to the image of the world and the expectations of the world as to what being a wife or a mother is about. Remember we read in Romans 12 too earlier, it's about being transformed to the image of Christ. The world has its own expectations, its own models, its own thoughts. There's traditions. There's things that have been passed down. That's not God's heart. God's heart is that you are conformed, transformed to the image of Christ. I mean, if we don't have perfectly behaved children, double hands raised if I could, <laughs> reading happily in a home that looks like something out of Pottery Barn catalogs, there must be something wrong with us, right? Amen. You know, early on, that used to bother me. I was worried. I had three boys, twins, and a year and a half later I had another little guy. So we had three toddlers running around our house. Can I tell you how difficult it was to keep our house clean? And anybody who has been to our house knows it is very lived in. <laughs> very lived in. It looks nothing like a catalog, let me tell you. Nothing. My mom and husband are uh, real estate agents. You know, and they, we, when they do real estate searches for people, and you look at these beautiful homes, man, they are just, I look at that and I'm like, can we just leave this house behind and go live in that one? Because ours, man, you could just like burn it to the ground and it would be okay. We would, probably would not miss anything. And it would probably burn very quickly because of all the dust and all the stuff that's hidden in all the corners. You see, there's a fear of admitting that we as mothers, as wives, as women in general, are not only not perfect, but there's many days that we are not coping well. Many days that we are like on the edge, the edge, and we don't know that we'll make it. But you know what happens? Because that's that dirty little secret buried in the hearts of most women and the enemy tries to keep it there so he he pushes more expectation he throws more pictures of the perfect mom or the perfect wife or the perfect ideal family situation we as women would be better off if we were truthful with how messy the process of mothering can be can I tell you when Chase came into our home, that little puppy, I reached out to a multitude of people. How do I deal with this? I talked with Danny after church multiple times. This is what, you know, 
What, what do we do? I called friends. Hey, we never had a puppy that did this before. What am I supposed to do with this? I had no problem. But you know, as moms, as wives, many times it's hard to call up that friend and say, this just happened and what am I supposed to do? How am I supposed to respond to that? It's hard for us to reach out. But if you go back to the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve hid in shame. Shame is one of the most effective weapons of the enemy. When we choose to hide and cower behind shame, instead of stepping into the light and saying, hey, this is what's going on, getting with friends. I'm not saying you post it on Facebook about, you know, all the craziness going on, but you have that circle of friends that you call up, you say, hey, today's not going well, I need some help. You know, I was perfectionist by birth. Apparently it was a birthright in our family. Got passed down in many ways. I was slightly OCD. Okay, maybe a lot OCD. Everything had to have its perfect little spot. Had to be lined up a certain way. My closet had to be organized by color, by shirt, by uh, whether it was a career outfit or a workout outfit. Everything got ironed. Um, my sheets I ironed because I did not want wrinkles in my sheets when I went to bed. I, I was just very crazy, okay? So Ralph and I find out that we're pregnant, that I'm pregnant. He's not pregnant, but I'm pregnant. <laughs> and then we find out, not only that, it was twins. And I remember going in my room, sitting down on the bed, crying, saying, God, what? What? How am I going to do this? And he's like, that's the very reason. Because, you know, we raised my nephew, Michael, for the most part. Single child, easy as pie, never cried. I don't even think he ever spit up on us. That was just him. Easy. I mean, th there was no problems. And it was almost like God was saying, yeah, we're going to work on this perfectionist aspect. We're going to deal with some of that OCD stuff that you got going on. And the best way to do that is to give you two at once. Because guess what? That's a little bit harder to juggle. And you know, when I had the twins, we were going through the pregnancy. Man, everybody had an opinion. Everybody. Natural ver birth versus C-section. I'm like, hello, it's my body? <laughs> Let me choose. I appreciate it, but come on. Then we bring the twins home, and it was breastfeed versus bottle feeding. And I remember, I was like, this is not working. But the expectation, the pressure, because of what everybody thought. You know, it went on and on, but can I tell you, it really delivered me, really delivered me from worrying about other people's opinions and expectations. In Romans 8, 1, it tells us there is no condemnation to those who are in Christ. In the Passion, Passion Translation, it, said, it goes like this, So now the case is closed. There remains no accusing voice of condemnation against those who are joined in life union with Jesus. So women, even though you may feel condemned, even though you may feel less than or unworthy, you are not. You are not condemned by your messy home. You are not condemned by your lack of desire to homeschool. You are not condemned by your personal sins or shortcomings. You are not condemned by the difficulty of caring for a child with special needs or the difficulty of caring for an aging parent. You're not condemned by your miscarriages or your infertility. You're not condemned even when you feel it, when you read the perfect parenting or marriage or dating moment that you see roll across your Facebook or Instagram screen. You're not condemned by your inability to cook. Hello, that was freeing for me. <laughs> You're not condemned by your child's behavior. Again, freeing for me. You're not condemned because you are divorced, unmarried, or because you're a single parent. You're not condemned by your body, again for me, which no longer looks the way it used to. Yep. 
You're not condemned by your repeated failures as a mother or wife, again for me. <laughs> You're not condemned by your rebellious children. Depends on the day. You're not condemned by the fears and the tears that take you to the edge of that cliff of despair. You're not condemned because you choose to feed your family not home-cooked meals <laughs> or all in organic ingredients. Again, mom cooks, not me. <laughs> You're not condemned by your need for a vacation alone. <laughs> You are not condemned for not living up to the standards of your mother or your mother-in-law or that perfect altogether friend. Mothers, wives, young ladies, even though you may feel condemned, you are not. You do not need to be perfect. You can walk free from the expectations of others. Find what works for you. Find what works for your marriage for your children, for your household, and then walk in that. Holy Spirit is more than willing when you sit down and ask, okay, Holy Spirit, this is not working this way. What do I need to do? There came a time in my life after having the twins and Christopher and having a marriage where we were trying to fit this model and God finally looked at me and said, Wendy, that's not your model. That's not the model for your household. Why don't you let me show you? And I was able to walk free from a lot of the expectation, a lot of the self-imposed expectations to find what worked. And then I began to see our family, our household grow and thrive. So the second myth that we're going to kind of debunk today, the thought that a woman's highest calling is to be a wife and mother. You know, I'm guessing that that particular myth developed in reaction to people who actually devalued the important work of mothers and wives who traditionally stayed at home. And please understand that being a wife, being a mother is extremely important, has eternal value. So I am not saying that it's not highly valued or honored. But this statement that gets thrown around many times is actually a distortion of what the Bible has to say to humans and particularly women. You know, for some women, I can tell you they were absolutely birthed to be moms. There was a young lady, a young couple that used to come to our church years ago that got transferred because of work. She was absolutely, her purpose in life was to be a mom. That's what she did. That was where she thrived. And I can remember looking at her thinking, yeah, no, that's not me. That, that's not going to work for me. Not that I don't love my kids. And please understand, just because I say that that's not my calling doesn't mean I don't love my children. It just means that this is a role that God's given me, but it's not the only thing in my life. That is not where I find all of my value. Again, referring back to our scripture in Romans 12 too, a woman's highest calling is to follow Christ and be transformed to His image. Everything else we do has to flow out of that. Matthew 6.33 tells us to seek first His kingdom. He does not tell us to seek first a husband. He does not tell us to seek first motherhood. He does not tell us to seek first ministry or leadership or a career. None of those things are even in that list. He says, when you seek first my kingdom, all these other things are going to flow out of that. And you will be successful in all of those things. But we are not called to do that because when we seek those things, they become idols. You ever seen families where the husband is the idol? The children is, are the idols? Their career, making money, is the idol? That's not God's heart. God's heart is that you're transformed to the image of Christ, which comes by seeking His kingdom first. Our highest calling as women and as men is to be image bearers. 
He created us in the image of Himself. In the garden, it says He created us in His image. So our calling, our purpose in life is to deliver that image to the world. To represent that image of the Father to the world around us. You see, women were created in the image of God just as men were. That is our core identity. That is what we are called to live our lives out of. And when we reduce women to whether or not they are married or whether or not they have children, we minimize the potential God has for their lives. There are many women. I sit and I think about, you know, Priscilla and Aquila, whom Paul references in Scripture. Great leaders in the New Testament church. We know they were married, but it never says they had children. Maybe they did, but usually that's referenced in Scripture. But we know that they were spiritual parents to many throughout the New Testament. And yes, Genesis 1 tells us that God said, Be fruitful and multiply. But that was only a portion of His command. Physical reproduction is part of God's plan. It's part of what He calls humans to do. Human life depends upon it. Like, it's not going to happen if we don't be fruitful and multiply. But physical reproduction is only one aspect of that. If it wasn't, then Jesus and Paul would have been massive failures in God's eyes. Neither one of them had physical children. But let me tell you, they both had multitudes of spiritual children. You know, part of my heart in today was I grew up in the church. I spent years in church. And I remember even as a little girl, you'd walk in on Mother's Day and it was hand out the pink carnations and I think they had different colors if, if you were a mom or if your parent had passed away or whatever. And I remember seeing women that would walk in and they didn't get a carnation that day because they weren't a mom. And how society labels and attaches these things. And then people are judged by it. How many women do you know that desperately want a child and they can't have a child? Does that mean God looks down on them? Does that, God, does that say God looks at them and says, as a woman, you're, you're not as valuable? No, it doesn't. That's, those are thoughts, those are myths that I hope we have debunked today. That as a woman, whether you're married or single, whether you have children or you don't have children, <coughs> your value as a woman is undisputed with God. He loves you because you are His daughter. Yes. Not because of the label you carry, not because of the title you wear, not because of what you do or don't do or how well you do it. God's heart for you is strictly because you are His daughter. Men, His heart for you is strictly because you are His children, His sons. Your value is not tied to that. We honor you as mothers. We honor you as women. But we honor across the board everybody in this room. You know, as I thought about this, there's a strong parallel between the commission God gave in Genesis 1 of being fruitful and filling the earth and reigning with the commission that was given out in Matthew 28, which says, Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. You know, there's a th theme running out throughout Scripture. And this is it. God blesses us so that we can be a blessing. That's His desire. Whether you're a wife, a mother, 
a single, a husband, a father, does not matter. His heart is that he blesses you so that you can be a blessing. We are called to go out into the world and multiply disciples. It says, go therefore and make disciples. Sounds very similar to be fruitful and multiply. So whether you are a physical mother of natural born children, or whether you're that woman sitting here that's a spiritual mom to many, you're doing well. And the Father's heart is for you. So women, today we honor you. Mothers, we honor each of you. And we call you each blessed. And we're just going to ask all the ladies in the house to stand up for a quick moment. And I see a few gentlemen trying to hop up back there. <laughs> we just want to say that you're blessed. You're highly valued. Your Father in Heaven loves you to no end. And He looks down on each of you and He applauds you. No matter what your circumstance is in life, no matter what is going on, He says, I love you. You're mine. You're my daughter. No matter how bad you messed up yesterday, no matter what trial you just came through or are going through, you're mine and I love you. So we're just going to pray over you and then my dad's going to come up and close the service. So if you're sitting around one of the ladies, I just ask you to put your hand out on their arm, on their shoulder. Please keep it to the arm or the shoulder. <laughs> Father, we just love you. Can somebody grab Helena back there? Lord, we thank you. Father, that you created each of us, male and female, in your image. And Father, you've empowered us to be who you've called us to be. And as women, we have been called to release your nature, your nurturing aspect into this world. Father, I just pray that your hand would be upon each of the ladies standing up here. Father, we call them blessed because we know that you've called them blessed. Father, whatever the struggles are, whatever the fears, the insecurities, whatever the pain that they're carrying, Father, I pray you would wrap your arms around them. That, Father, they would walk out of here feeling like you just poured out your love upon them. Strengthen them, Lord, for the day. Give them wisdom. Whether it's at home or in the workplace or at school, Father, I pray your wisdom would pour out upon them. That, Father, in those difficulties, they would turn to you, they would look to you. That, Father, they would know that you're smiling down upon them. So, Father, we call them blessed. We call them highly favored daughters of you, the Most High. And we thank you for equipping each of them. Holy Spirit, rise up in them. Be with them, walk with them, talk with them that they would be all that you've called them to be. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.